Um, great, thank you so very much, Liz. I hope you will join us with the other speakers as well for the panel discussion um, in which we wanted to bring up some of the themes that have been raised so far uh, in both the talks that we've um, heard, but also from the questions that are coming through. So thank you very much for, for our panel for, for coming together. I wondered if I might start, um, Dr Till, with yourself because you have been working on a very special project which is trying to, as I understand it, streamline that connection between the families of deceased individuals and their introduction into an ICC service. And I wondered if you might just tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. Yes, um, sure. I mean, I, I can't take credit for initiating this and um, there are a whole number of people um, involved. Um, Elijah Bear and Mary Shepherd as sort of um, the um, steering it. Working with the British Heart Foundation and uh, the GMSAs. Um, so what happens at the moment is someone dies and the, the poor family this is such a shock and it's so unexpected. Not many of us outside this field really understand the process that then has to happen next. And so it's thrown upon you um, just when you are grieving terribly and trying to understand and absorb what's happened. Um, and in those um, few weeks that um, happen afterwards, um, the coroner uh, gets notified and the coroner's officer is informing you of what's happened usually. Um, and what has to happen um, if we're going to really provide uh, an excellent service is that the family members need to get to an ICC service. Um, and what happens at the moment is uh, the heart and the body are sent for autopsy um, and then the autopsy results are notified to the GP and then sometimes the GP is um, it's recommended that he then refers into an ICC service um, he doesn't always do that he she doesn't really um, sometimes understand that sometimes there's a, a good instruction to do that but no one really tells the family what they've got to do um, or what what is suggested that they do and, and of course the family um, it, are finding things quite hard to process I would imagine at that time too I've happily never been in that situation and the other thing that's got to happen is that um, if, if we want to do a genetic molecular autopsy which can really help further down the line um, we need to save tissue and we need to store it and consent needs to be taken for that and so often you talk to families and somewhere somewhere in those early weeks someone said to them about saving tissue and they didn't really understand and just said no and then it's lost forever um, so it's um, we're, we're just trying to make this process easier for families for bereaved families um, and what we're trying to work is work with the coroners and the coroner's officer the coroner's officers are usually very lovely people used to dealing with grieving people um, and we're arming them with um, the information they need that should the pathologist say this looks like a potentially inheritable cardiac condition the coroner's officer can then signpost the family um, directly to um, one of the ICC services so um, alongside this will be all sorts of um, easy forms to understand consent forms etc that the coroner's officer could do with the family um, and a directory of ICC services that um, the AICC are putting together actually but um, they you know so that people know where they get, they need to go um, and who's doing what around the country so that uh, they can access something um, uh, local to them um, so that, that's what we're trying to work with and of course every step along that rather convoluted pathway we've sort of had a look at it and thought well that could be improved by this and you know there's some patient information that could really be provided at this point and so um, we're sort of trying to produce a toolkit to guide people along the way and I, I found that last talk uh, very very interesting Liz um, so that we could um, you know we can certainly work uh, on 
um, providing patients and families with the information they need at this very difficult time. Still a view. Um, thank you so much, Jan. Um, I, I'm sorry we haven't had much of a chance to get through some questions in the comments box, but um, there is one that I'd like to um, pose to Antonis and Nabil, and that's from Rana from Hull University Hospital. She wants to know, should we be screening for cardiomyopathies in children under the age of 10? And Jan too. And Jan too, of course. Uh, yeah, so there was a that, I mean, I think I think the thinking behind this has changed in recent years. It used to be felt that um, the phenotype uh, most commonly emerges during the adolescent ages, but there have been studies since then that show that actually um, children develop the, the phenotype as well. So there was a there was a study in particular by Juan Kasky's group, I think, a couple of years ago that showed that about um, 5% of first degree child relatives undergoing screening met diagnostic criteria of HCM. And I think the overall yield of a diagnosis in, in a child first degree relatives was approaching 10%. So that's not a that's not a small number. So I think the thinking behind that that is changing. I, I think our our own practice is to offer a screening at the age of for, for HCM this is at an age of around five or six and then you know if the child is otherwise asymptomatic pick it up a bit later on in the in the in the towards the adolescent years but I think practice varies widely and and I think the um thinking behind this is also is also changing I, I think probably in the future we may have um, more routine screening of, of younger people as other as other studies such as the one from the from Great Ormond almost, almost Street uh, emerge. Um, in terms of other conditions it's it's a bit more so I guess the same applies for dilated cardiomyopathy. I think um, for ch iron channelopathies such as long QT it's a bit bit more tricky because the, the QT interval does change with age as well so um, but but Jan probably knows more about that than I do. Yeah. Yeah, there's no no easy answer, is there, Nabil? No. Um, uh, and it's it's changing. Um, yeah, we too would um, screen for cardiomyopathies earlier than we used to. I quite like to get a baseline anyway. Um, you know, when yeah. the family first learns about this, I think it's quite reassuring for them to have an echo and yeah. just meet us. And um, exactly. so we will do it early anyway, and then you kind of adjust how often you're going to then repeat the screening uh, according to the to the age for cardiomyopathy, I think. Um, the um, long QT is, is incredibly difficult and um, at the risk of taking up some of the discussion time, I was looking at the questions coming in. Um, we, we would screen for long QT or we, we screen at any age. So if there's a baby, we will do an ECG and screen. Um, the ECG um, is very difficult in those first few months of life, but sometimes you can pick up a very long QT. Um, long QT is also, you know, our best screening test. If you've got an equivocal long QT, it's probably the exercise test. So then you've got to really wait till they're about four and a half, five before you can get them running, I find. <laughs> Although we had a sprightly four year old um, this week running on the treadmill. <laughs> um, and, and long QT, you know, we're so often getting the gene now um, that it's a different conversation. Um, and, and I was interested in, you know, your your comments about the ethics of screening and that this is a choice because that does raise quite difficult conundrums for us in, in looking after children, because, you know, what do you do when the parent has said, yes, I would like you to screen for long QT, but, but then on finding the results, doesn't really want to use treatment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah. you don't really know where you stand as a paediatrician, because your normal response is, I've got a duty of care to that child, and I think they will be better on treatment. But Screening is a choice, isn't it? Um, so it's it's a fine line there, which often presents difficulties for us. Um, absolutely, yeah. mm. talking to to families at length. I think it's just that um, in, sort of informed decision, and you know, this is what you can expect if the test is positive for your child. This is what we would recommend. 
Um, so, so it's that sort of, you know, initial discussion, I think, that probably, you know, and it's so important and, and, and sometimes we forget, don't we, because, you know, well, um, certainly prior to the pandemic, they'd walk in and have an ECG before they even got to, to see you. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, it's so often forgotten. I think it's really important. Um, thank you so much. Um, I have a question for Liz, if that's OK. Liz, um, during your talk, you mentioned the um, the value in um, future Nestle clinics. We've certainly seen that here at the Brompton with some of the Nestle clinics we've done. Where do you see the role of the ICC nurse specialist from here? Where do you see us developing and what we're going to do next? I hope it's big things, Liz. You know me, Beth, and it's always big, big <laughs> visions. Um, I mean, certainly uh, we, we never need to, to lose the fact that ICC uh, will only work by being multidisciplinary. And there is no one role that will be able to encompass all the really important elements of looking after patients. But I definitely think that there is a, is, is a huge role in, in the nursing side of things. It's important to have that bridge to bring the medicine and the genetics and the counselling and the psychological support together and what do nurses do well we we do that well <laughs> and 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 we're multi-skilled and we have a bit of everything we have that clinical knowledge we have that appreciation for, for need for support and um, so i see us being uh obviously more more skilled in terms of the clinical side but also that the, the counselling side the making sure that the um ramifications, the benefits and the costs of genetic testing are understood and that we support patients and families through decisions that they might regret or that they might not uh, in the future. So I hope that's as big a vision as you have, Bethan, um, but that's certainly mine. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. <laughs> and well, thank you very much to all of our speakers this morning um, and uh, also for this fantastic panel discussion. So we're coming up to uh, break time now. We